That's right, folks. We are back with the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. We're coming back during the offseason to give you some special moments. And that's right. The Atlanta Falcons had a special moment happen. A new defensive coordinator has been hired underneath Arthur Smith. I'm Derek Rackley. He's DJ Shockley. Yes. And Dave Archer. The crew is back together to talk yes. a little Ryan Nielsen. And here's, fellas, this is what we're going to discuss today. Who is Ryan Nielsen? We're going to hmm. tell the people that are listening who this guy is and what his performance was like at his previous stop with the New Orleans Saints. Of course, how we expect him to adapt and evolve with this Falcons defense. We'll also talk about Jerry Jerry Gray. He was hired as well as a defensive assistant. Um, and then we'll look ahead a little bit to the free agency and NFL draft and maybe discuss some areas where the Falcons need to beef up under their new defensive coordinator. So Dave, let's start with you. I'd like you to try your hardest to give me Ryan Nielsen from what you learned in the press conference yesterday, because I know you were an active participant. We heard you asking questions. We did. Give us Ryan Nielsen in three words, if you can. You know what? I'll name that tune in one Oh, note. okay. Oh. Attack. Attack. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's even better. That's that's what you call short and sweet. And then he left. He didn't uh, even say anything else. He's just done. My uh, Dave just kind of mic dropped. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. You're up, DJ. All right. Three I, words or less. All right. I got accountable, passionate, and relatable. I got okay. that from watching him yesterday. Obviously, to be in this position he's in now, obviously got to be accountable. Speak for himself. I thought he was really passionate about some of the things he talked about. And then, obviously, the relatable part is to his players, uh, to his organization, the things that he'd done over the years. So I, I thought those things really stuck out for me when, you know, I was sitting there watching the stream yesterday. Yeah, and I agree with you. I, I, I mentioned two words after Dave. Those were kind of two of my three. I thought – I thought he was short and sweet, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that he was kind of – when he was asked questions, he point. was very to the point. Yeah. Like, he didn't kind of fluff around it. He didn't go into a whole lot of detail. He just said what his vision is and then what they're going to do. And then I would also say intense. And maybe that kind of piggybacks off of what you, Dave, you could just kind of see in his face. There was a couple little smiles, but more than that, he was he's like your typical defensive lineman, the dude, defensive coach. The dude said he wanted to go practice yesterday. <laughs> he said, ready to go. <laughs> so I said short, sweet, and intense were my three words on Ryan Nielsen. So let's go back into it a little bit. Obviously, coming from the New Orleans Saints organization, that was actually his first foray into the NFL. Spent a lot of time coaching in the college game was hired uh, by the New Orleans Saints and, of course, worked with the defensive line and the defensive unit his last couple of years being the co-defensive coordinator duties. I think it's somewhat interesting for us three right here because we were with the organization back when, De when Dennis Allen was just getting his start in the NFL. And Dennis Allen has risen his way through the ranks, obviously the head coach, also the defensive play caller for New Orleans. And Nielsen got to work underneath him, Dave. So, from your vantage point, obviously Atlanta gets to see New Orleans twice a year, every single year. What would you pick up as far as what his style is and what his background is having worked with that defense? Well, I think that the things that you want to look at, and obviously New Orleans personnel is different than our personnel right now. Um, but w what were they good at? Um, they were good at keeping people off the scoreboard. They're ninth in the league in scoring defense. Okay, And again, Dennis Allen and the rest of the staff is part of that just like Jerry Gray and other people will be a part of Nielsen's staff here as they start to assemble this thing. They were fifth in the National Football League in sacks with 48 sacks. Okay, And those sacks are by a number of different plays. They have 13 players that had at least one sack. They had five players that had at least five sacks. Cam Jordan led them, and we know he's been a thorn in the Falcons' side since we've been playing New Orleans with him on the team. I think 23 career games, he's got 24 23 sacks, sacks or something like that. So Matt Ryan, nightmare for Matt Ryan. Okay? <laughs> but all that being said, he led the team with eight and a half sacks last year. You think, wow, only eight and a half sacks? Yeah, but four other guys had five-plus sacks. What's that tell you? That tells you they're attacking from a lot of different places and a lot of different angles, which bodes well if the personnel doesn't necessarily match or you don't have a Cam Jordan, now all of a sudden I have the ability to manufacture pass rush with multiple guys. That's what they did in New Orleans. And then and then you look at them, they were fifth overall in overall defense. They're number five in the, in the National Football League in defense defending the run and the pass combined. Those numbers look great. And, again, I know it's not our personnel, 
but he knows what a good defense looks like, Shock, and he knows how to develop players uh, that have gone on and, and reaped some of the riches at other teams. You've got some young players that came on a little bit over the last couple seasons that they've drafted that have become players that he's developed. So those are things that jump out to me about his style. Now, I think you're going to have to we, – we, we all know that you're going to fit it to the, to the talents of the dudes you yeah, have. Yeah. And Atlanta's got a lot of work to do. You've got guys to re-sign. You've got guys to go get. And so we don't even know what that talent base is going to look like, to be honest with you. Have a kind of idea. We know 97 is going to be lined up. You know, he didn't go anywhere. Troy Anderson, 44, he's going to be sitting in there. But you don't know a lot about some of that front seven that's going to either need to be re-signed or replaced. And so it's kind of hard to decide what that's going to look like. Yeah, I mean, DJ, I think when you look at, and I'm sure Arthur Smith looked at the same thing, with Ryan Nielsen, Dave talked about Cam Jordan, right? But think about the levels, like Cam Jordan, Demario Davis, Marshawn Lattimore. So he's had a chance to work with some guys that are pretty good defensive players now. So that doesn't necessarily just mean because he spent a lot of his time working with defensive linemen that that's where his specialty is. He's yeah. kind of expanded his roles, having been the co-defensive coordinator, and he's seen what some premier players look like at all three levels of the defense. And that's what's most important. I, I, I think you guys bring up a, so a couple of really good points about the levels in which – you have guys on a particular defense that fits a particular scheme. And, Arch, I thought you brought up a good point about a lot of people say sometimes it's about the Jimmys and Joes, not the X's and O's a lot of times. But I think in this situation, I think it's a little bit of both. And yesterday he talked about, I think, uh, you know, there was a question posed to him about if you got a guy this size, you got a guy that size. And he said, look, whatever person that we have, we're going to find a way to fit him into the scheme that best gives him the advantage or gives him the, the ability to be able to win in our particular scheme. He said, yeah, there's going to be some things that we take from what was already here. There's going to be a lot of things that we add to the fray. And then the personnel we have here, we're obviously going to mold those guys to fit the scheme we want. And I thought that was one of the things that, that, that stuck out to me is he talked about having a defense that is sound in technique and scheme. So you talk about personnel, you talk about some guys maybe not fitting exactly what people may think he should fit in this particular scheme where there's things that he can do to give those guys advantages to win in a ball game or depending on who you're playing and what you got to do because there was a lot of talk about 3-4 three, to 4-3, four, three, all that kind of stuff. But I love the fact he said we can be multiple, and I want to stop people. At the end of the day, that's what you want. If you stop people, guess what? It don't matter if it's 3-4 four, or 4-3. Four, the guys, the 11 guys or whoever you, you got out there, it's definitely going to make a big, big, big difference in this particular scheme. So I, I love the fact that he talked so much about his scheme being a bigger part of not just it being personnel-wise, but we're going to find guys that fit the scheme we want, and then we're going to be able to execute in that manner. But also they got to play technically sound in that. And that goes directly to the point you talk about, Rack, about having guys at each level who can do it. Think about DeMario Davis has been was with him the entire time he was there. And we've seen him. We've talked about – how he's all over the field being that guy in the middle of the field. And you got guys on the back end. Remember they had, you know, the Honey Badger back there. They had Malcolm Jenkins back there, mm -hmm. uh, a guy who was a very cerebral guy. And you bring in a uh, – I know we're going to talk about Coach Gray in a minute, but you bring in a guy who, you know, knows what that secondary could look like with two young guys that we have back there. Could Jalen Hawkins turn into the Malcolm Jenkins? Always on the tight ends, always coming down in it and being a smart player. We saw him make huge strides this year from that safety spot. So I think – they're the pieces here, along with the scheme, that you can kind of gel together. And it's going to take time, but I think at the end of the day, you got a couple guys that are going to be teaching these guys to get them to the right spot. Well, and I thought what was interesting is yesterday, or in his press conference, he didn't really want to talk about New Orleans a whole lot, which I can appreciate that, right? Like he's saying, I'm with the Atlanta Falcons now. But we could talk a little bit about it, right? And we talked about Cam Jordan, but I think it's also interesting to note that he worked for four years with Trey Hendrickson, right? Mm -hmm. Trey Hendrickson's with the Bengals now, but his last year in New Orleans, he had 13 and a half sacks. So he has seen guys that know how to put pressure on a quarterback. Now, at the end of the day, you got to have Joes, right? You got to have dudes to go out and make plays, and personnel's different. Maybe Atlanta does not have a Cam Jordan, a Trey Hendrickson type body 
yet. But at least he knows when you get that type of player, yeah. when you get that type of work ethic, and the scheme to match how to get those guys to the quarterback. We've talked about it a lot, Dave. It's one area where Atlanta's defense needs to get better. They've got to find a way to get more pressure on opposing quarterbacks. Yeah, only 21 sacks last year. I mentioned the numbers. Nine players had sacks on this Falcon team, at least one. Only one player, Grady Jarrett, had more than four, more than five sacks. We just talked about how this Saint team, had five players that had five-plus sacks. So you love the fact that there's development and guys can create problems from different levels. Demario Davis, you mentioned, second-level player. I think he had five-and-a-half sacks at the linebacker spot. We think that that's something that Troy Anderson could be really good at, a blitzing linebacker, a guy that's got a big body. It's hard to pick up in protection mm -hmm. if you're a smaller back in there and you got a guy coming at him like that. We saw some success. If Rashawn Evans is, in fact, retained your leading tackler, Rashawn Evans had some, some, some success with that as well. So I think that there's and, – and there's – you're going to look at what they did in New Orleans, and you're certainly going to compare it to what you could potentially do here. And I think there's some some matches there. And that's not let's not be naive. Now he he did not call the plays per play, and that's going to be a learning curve. I don't think we're not pulling our wool wool over anybody's eyes or or trying to pull it over our own eyes. He's good. There's going to be a learning curve with him. Okay, Jerry Gray is a guy that has called defense, and we're, I know we're going to talk about Jerry. And maybe we can do that now. But Jerry Gray is a guy uh, from a secondary standpoint. This guy was a number one draft pick back in 1985 for the Rams. I mm -hmm. played against Jerry Gray. Good player. Came from what they used to call DBU. That was Texas. Because uh -huh. it seemed like they had two guys come out every year that played in the <laughs> league. Jerry was one of those. Played with the Rams, played with a couple teams, and then rounded into one of the really good secondary coaches in the National Football League was the pass game defensive pass game coordinator in, in Green Bay. Think about the guys he's worked with. Was in Minnesota, Xavier Rhodes. Probably the top corner at the time, Xavier Rhodes was a monster. He came in here, and we couldn't even throw the ball on this side of the field. Yep. Jair Alexander, who's become maybe the top corner, or at least in the conversation, the top corner in the league in Green Bay. That's two different places and two corners that he's worked at. Now, both those guys were number one draft picks, but still – that he worked with those guys. He knows again knows what it looks like, and he's called defense. So the collaborative effort that this defensive staff will have, namely those two guys, I think that bodes well to start putting what Shock was talking about, putting guys in position, which is ultimately the the idea in their best position to be successful. Yeah, absolutely. You got a, a kind of a rising star in Ryan Nielsen, and you pair him up with what you would call a savvy veteran in the business, a guy that's been around a lot of different places. As you mentioned, Arch, he's called defenses. So if there ever becomes those issues shock during the game, as Ryan Nielsen gets his feet underneath himself yeah. as far as specific play calls against this defense, certain situation, Jerry's going to be in the headset. He's going to be like, hey, Ryan, I think I like this. I like this call. I like this defense. I like this personnel package. I like this way to match up against what we're seeing offensively. That seems like a pretty good mesh between those two guys. And it's, I think it's a perfect marriage because Arch just talked about having a guy who now is going to come in. Now he's going to have the opportunity to have the play calls. But now he's got somebody else who he can springboard it off. And I've been around a bunch of teams where, you know, obviously be the backup. Sometimes you're on the headsets and you can hear a lot of communication going on. Having somebody who's been there, done that, and has seen it gives you a little bit more confidence to say, all right, this is what we're going to do in these certain situations. Here's how I think we should attack them. You talk about being a, a pass game coordinator. I mean, uh, obviously all these guys know concepts, schemes, formations, and all that kind of stuff. But from that particular part of it, that's all you see. That's all you – you know, not all you see, but it's majority of what you look at. And it's how you go about trying to attack a particular offense, especially when you say we want to be an attacking style. Arch just already pointed out exactly how, how many guys were able to get to the quarterback. But when you're in an attacking style, I think regardless of who those players are, if you're putting pressure on anybody, that's going to be an issue. And you got guys coming from all three levels, and you're not sure who is hot. What, you know, you don't know what, what style it is. It's going to be difficult on anybody. And you mentioned a couple guys. I went back and looked up. I mean, what about a guy like Corlin Finnegan? How, 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 how much of a nuisance was that guy when he was in Tennessee? Uh, Jason McCourty was another guy that Jerry Gray coached. Those are guys, in, uh, along with the, the other big-time names you already mentioned, Arch, are guys who were effective, guys who were, uh, guys who were very productive in their roles. And I think we go into what we have now with an A.J. Terrell, with you know, Jalen and Richie, all young guys still looking and feeling and want to be hungry and want to be the best they can. 
and both safeties have an opportunity to play a lot more last year. Now you're bringing a guy with all this experience, and he could turn on the tape and say, here's Jair Alexander. Here's guys I coached from, you know, 10, 12 years ago doing exactly what we're doing now, fitting into this scheme. I think it only bodes well for the entire marriage of Ryan Nielsen and Coach Gray together. Such a good point Shock's making in the fact, and we all know this, and sometimes the fans aren't privy to this, but – Players uh, need to be shown why they're doing something. What am I, why am I doing that? And Shock just talked about being able to put the tape on of, of these different players that he talked about. Um, that's important because uh, as much as we look at the board and we watch tape and stuff like that, then we get outside and this is why you put your foot here. This is why you'd step here. If you can show players that, there's a tremendous buy-in. And when mm-hmm. you're, you can throw the tape on of guys like he's talking about, this is why we're teaching it this way. This is the way we're going to jam. This is the way we're going to defend with an inside technique. This is the way we're going to press bail. And this is why it works. And this is what we've done before. That there's a lot of that helps the buy-in, no question about, for players that are kind of wondering because you wonder, okay, that's not how I've done it before. Why am I doing it like that? Boom, you show them. Hey, that, there you, then you get buy-in. You know what's interesting that you mentioned that, Dave? I started thinking back to my playing days, and I know you guys can kind of relate to this, but I didn't play on a defensive side of the ball. But Emmett Thomas was a guy that was here when, when I was playing, and he was always one of those guys that I would love to just go stand next to and talk to yeah. because not only was he such a great coach, but he was a phenomenal player in his day. And his messages, like, he's not going to give you, like, the, the chalkboard X's and O. Like, he's going to tell you what to do and why it works. And you know what? You listen to it because he's been there. Right? You listen there because he knows what he's talking about and he's seen it be successful before. Right. It's so crazy you bring up E.T. and a story and how he talks to you. I remember my rookie year, we were on the road somewhere in the preseason. And you're on the road, and, you know, you're just, you know, going out to get something to eat, and you come back to the hotel. He's coming out of the hotel. I'm coming in. He stops me and says – he knew it was a big game for me, maybe in the third or fourth, maybe in the last game, whatever, and I'm looking to make the team. And he just pulls me to the side and says, hey, look, you got all the twos. I've seen you do it in practice. Go out and just execute. Play your style. They want you to play your style. Don't do anything extra. And at that moment, I'm like, this Hall of Famer took – two, three, four minutes, defensive guy to say, you know what, I see something in you, go play ball, go, and I end up, you know, going out playing well and making the team, but I, I never forgot that moment yeah. that this defensive guy with all this experience, and like you just mentioned, would, would say something to me like that. So having that kind of impact, having a guy like you, we, we just talked about with Coach Gray who's been around the league and you talked about it, Arch, guys want to guys wanna have that kind of fulfillment where a coach tells them exactly – what it is and where they've done it and the guys that they've seen do it, and now they're pouring into you. People forget now, yeah, yeah, these guys make a lot of money. They're, you know, superstars and all right. But these guys, they need that as well. They need to be pushed a little bit and have guys kind of pour into them so that, hey, I can get the job done. So you have that resource. If a guy like A.J. Terrell or Jalen Hawkins wants to go up and talk to Jerry Gray and say, hey, when we're running this package, like – what have you seen in the past? Like, who executes this the best? And he can, you can have that conversation. Yeah, I saw Jair Alexander with Green Bay. Like, he used to always get his body in this position mm-hmm. when he's facing this type of receiver because it limits that, right? You can get into those detailed conversations. Again, if those players seek it out and they want to know that knowledge, you've got a guy that can give them a whole lot of experience uh, and wherewithal from his, his experiences with his past uh, teams. So, you've got a guy in Jerry Green that's been around. Did Jerry Gray get you, Arch? I can't remember. I don't even yeah. want to look it up. I know he's going to. I know he's going to hit me with it. Actually. I got to look it up though. So you, you've got a guy in Jerry Gray that brings all the experience. You got a guy in Nielsen that, since he joined the Saints in 2017, that organization had 281 sacks, which was the second most in the NFL during mm-hmm. that time, finishing top 10 in sacks five of the six last six seasons. We talked about that's an area that needs to improve. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on The Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. 
Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. So let's shift gears, fellas, as we kind of close this thing down, and let's get into a little bit more of what needs to be addressed in the offseason. Because it's easy to say, oh, well, what's Ryan Nielsen? What's his defense going to look like with Atlanta? Um, we haven't even finished the Super Bowl yet. Right. So they still have all of the pre-draft stuff, the draft free agency. they got to continue to put the personnel pieces on this defense. But again, DJ, let's start with you. Like the areas from a personnel perspective, we don't necessarily need to go into names, but areas that need to be addressed for Nielsen to be able to take this defense to the next level. I'm going to go probably an unorthodox place that I think maybe a lot of people may have thought about, um, but I'm going to go on the offensive side of the ball and say we need that third guy. You need We, we know what Drake is. We know what Kyle is. We need somebody to complement those two guys. And when I think about it, let's think about who's in the Super Bowl right now. Obviously, uh, with the Kansas City Chiefs, you got Juju. You got We, we saw Vida Scantley play well. And then you got Kelsey to add to it. So there's three pieces that makes it really hard for you. You look at the Philadelphia Eagles. Obviously, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith are really good to go along with their tight end. That's, that's, that puts a lot of pressure on a lot of opposing defenses. Uh, you go to the Cincinnati Bengals. We know exactly how many players they have on that offensive side of the ball with Boyd and Higgins and Chase. And now, now to mention Hayden uh, Hurst is, as well with another tight end. You look at all these teams who are going deep into the playoffs – and all those guys have quarterbacks, but they also have two or three guys who can stretch a defense, who can put pressure on you. You get one on one, or you try to, you know, kind of, kind of put a, a a a cloud over a tight end or something. You got other guys who can win, and we saw Drake have the ability to win last year. We know Kyle has the ability to win. Let's add another third piece to that. I know Alamba they came on play really well this past season. We thought Brian Edwards probably could be that guy, uh, but I think if we add another piece there, that gives you know, whoever's playing quarterback uh, coming in next season, uh, an opportunity to win. So I like the fact going out and try to find another uh, pass catcher that can help you be really efficient in the pass game. Well, and maybe that ends up helping Ryan Nielsen learning how to kind of develop things, practicing against weapons offensively as they go through the offseason into training camp. Dave, how about you? Does anything stick out defensively as far as needs for Ryan Nielsen as they really look to improve on this side of the ball? Well, and let's be clear, Shock's not talking about the first round. So a lot of you people are talking, thinking, well, we need a, it could be a free agent wide receiver. He's right, not talking right. about drafting a, a wide receiver the first round. I don't know. I think it's some maybe saying, wait a minute, I don't want right to, I don't want to draft another receiver <laughs> in the no, first no, round. No, that no, is no. not what Shock's talking no, about. No, I knew no, he no. was, I knew you and I were on the same page. <laughs> I wasn't sure if they were thinking that way, but yeah, certainly researching and finding another weapon uh, would not hurt a young quarterback in Desmond Ritter if, in fact, he becomes the guy that's the starter here. Um, defensively, for me, Rack, uh, it all starts for me in the interior of the defensive line. I think there's a number of really good players from a free agent standpoint, and we're not going to discuss names, but that are going to be potentially in the offing. Um, there's a couple of young guys coming out of college uh, from a defensive line stand, interior defensive line standpoint. I think you got to prevent people from being able to run the ball between the tackles. And I thought Atlanta had a tough time stopping the run game. When you start talking about being an effective defense, it means you can put people in uncomfortable third down situations. We didn't do enough of that this year. Atlanta was near the bottom of the league in third down conversions this year, which meant the other team's offense was on the field. Now, you did a good job once you got down to the red zone and limiting scores. I think Atlanta gave up about 22 points per game, which is not terrible. But teams were possessing the football, and if they've got the ball, we don't. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunities for big plays or score – gets pared down, and all of a sudden you've got nine possessions in a game, maybe ten possessions. One, We had two games where we had eight possessions in the game. A normal NFL game is 12 to 13 possessions, so that makes it really difficult on Arthur Smith to be able to design something to where you can get some plays and be willing to take some shots on a couple of series. You might give a series away because we're going to take a couple of shots. Couldn't do that, couldn't afford to do that because you couldn't get off the field on defense, and to me that means stopping the run. You got to stop the run game. You've got to make them a one-dimensional team. There's no question you got to be able to rush the passer in this league. But I'm looking for development. We talked about the new defensive coordinator. What's his what's his forte? His forte is the defensive line guy. Okay. He's going to come in, help with the interior guys, but that also means those edge guys. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for Arnold Ebikati to take another step. 
I'm looking for D'Angelo Malone to get the gri- a grasp on what this game. He's already a core special teams player and an important player in that third phase. I'm looking for him to start affecting things on the defensive side of the football and what linebackers potentially. Toy Anderson, we mentioned those kind of, the development of the players that we already have is kind of where mind it, my mind is because I don't know what we're going to get free agency right, wise. I know right. there's some ideas, and I don't know what we're going to get. From a, from a draft standpoint, but the guys that we have here, we've got a young core nucleus TQ, of guys yeah. that have to take that next step. And you've got a developmental guy. Shock, you guys talked about Jerry Gray, development. Develop those two young safeties. Continue to develop A.J. Terrell. Maybe another guy on the other side. Maybe it's a draft pick or whatever. And then the edge players. Ebicady showed flashes of being able to get it done. Yeah. Can you take him to the next level? Can he – Go to the next level. And you mentioned it, Rack, recognizing that there's guys that have worked with dudes, whether it's on the D-line or in the secondary, that they they have an idea how it's supposed to work and how it's supposed to look. Listen, pay yeah. attention, take that next step, be willing to do that. You know, we talked on a previous podcast right before we ended the season about how Atlanta had to kind of weather the storm as far as the salary cap goes, and they're in a better position. So and I'm not going to sit here and say I'm looking forward to seeing how much they spend because <laughs> they've obviously said that they got to find the right piece, right? The right person that fits the chemistry and the mold of the Atlanta Falcons. But I'm interested to see if they go out and get somebody that's in the prime of his career defensively, that's able to make a difference. But not only that, bring the competition in to raise the level of play as some of those younger players that you talked about, right? Because you bring in a guy that's been in the league for four or five years, and maybe he's already a Pro Bowl type player, and, and a young kid sees him come in, they're like, well, well how am I going to get on the field? You know how you get on the field? You get better, yeah. and you right. make plays, right. right? And competition is what the NFL is all about. So who do they decide to bring in? Maybe it's a defensive lineman. Maybe it's somebody opposite A.J. Terrell in the free agency market. I don't know if it's going to happen, but I'd like to see it. I'd like to see somebody that's just a truly a proven stud in the NFL come to this team and make a difference on that side of the ball. So we've got a lot of time uh, to figure out what's going to happen with Ryan Nielsen, Jerry Gray, and this new staff on the defensive side of the ball. But, hey, we're here for it, huh? No doubt. We're here for it. What do you say? we got to get out on the grass. (laughs) I'm ready to get out on the grass. He's supposed to get (laughs) on the grass. (laughs) We just clicked over to February, and he's already ready. Let's get on the grass. grass. Let's start developing. (laughs) All right, that's going to wrap it up for the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Once again, that's Dave Archer, DJ Shockley. I'm Derek Rackley. Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll be back again for the bigger moments of the Atlanta Falcons offseason. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone.